Well, turn with me again to Revelation 9. We are looking tonight at the invasion of the pit creatures. I know that title sounds like an old horror movie, but this is really, literally going to be an invasion of pit creatures as we are going to see. Now, we have been looking at the trumpet judgments, and in chapter 8, we saw the first four. In chapter 8, verse 13, we discovered that the first four trumpets are separated from the last three in that the last three are called woes. The first three are often called the judgment of thirds because they all result in a third of something being destroyed. But the first four were directed at the earth. The last three are going to be directed at man. The first four affect the physical universe, but the sounding of the fifth trumpet will shift the focus from the physical to the spiritual realm. And these woes mark the deepest darkness and the most painful intensity of the great tribulation period. As terrible as these judgments have been so far, these are going to be worse. And tonight, we're going to be looking at the first woe or the fifth trumpet. And we read this passage a few minutes ago, but let's walk through it now. <clears throat> and I can't resist this. I just love the way John MacArthur introduces this chapter in his commentary. He says, because our world is the theater where the glorious God-honoring story of redemption is played out, Satan and his demon hosts have attacked the human race, turning the earth into the main battleground in their cosmic war against God, the holy angels, and the elect. <clears throat> Satan launched his first assault in the Garden of Eden, where he successfully tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God. And the disastrous consequences were that sin entered the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, Romans 5.12. He says, after the fall, God graciously promised a Savior who would come to destroy Satan and deliver people from his power. Satan countered by sending demons to cohabitate with human women, attempting to produce a hybrid demon-human race of people for whom the God-man could not atone. In response, God destroyed that race and the whole sinful world in the powerful judgment of the universal flood. The single greatest catastrophe that the earth has yet seen. He goes on to say, from the beginning to the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, Satan fought with all his impotent fury against the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of Jesus' ministry, Satan entered into Judas, who is called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve, that's Luke 22, verse 3, who then betrayed Christ into the hand of his murderers. The church has also been a special target of satanic assault. And in the future, Satan will serve God's purpose by being permitted to launch another deadly assault on the human race. That attack will come at the sounding of the fifth trumpet during the time of God's judgment in the great tribulation. So this indeed signals something brand new in the development of the revelation. This signals Satan now coming against men. Let's go back and read verses 1 through 3 again. And the fifth angel sounded... And I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. 
And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. <clears throat> now, these are not literal locusts here. They are locust-type creatures. They are referred to as locusts because they will swarm the earth like a great plague of locusts would swarm and devour fields of crops. Locusts were the most dreaded and destructive creatures of the ancient world. They are used in the Old Testament as an emblem of desolation and destruction. But note the repeated use of the comparison words like and as, showing that the things described here are related in terms of what they look like. So these were like horses, but they were not really horses. They had hair like the hair of women, but they were not necessarily women, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, someone may object and say, wait a minute, I thought you believed in literal judgments. I do. You say, aren't we supposed to take these things literally, like you have been emphasizing all along? Here is a basic premise of good biblical hermeneutics. Interpret the text literally unless there is something in the text or the context that indicates it is to be taken figuratively. So we need to ask, is there something in the text here or the context that would indicate that? And the answer is yes. We know these are not real locusts for at least three reasons. First of all, they do not eat any vegetation. Secondly, Proverbs 30, 27 tells us that locusts have no king, but these guys have one. And third, they don't even look like locusts. As is borne out by the description given here, these are not natural locusts, but a visual representation of the hordes of demons loosed upon the earth for this particular plague. <clears throat> Folks, there is absolutely no question in my mind that what is being described here is a great horde of ferocious demons that will be released on the earth to torment those who have received the mark of the beast. And you know, I've heard people say that, well, you know, maybe John is trying to describe modern military equipment like an Apache attack helicopter or Muslims with gas masks on, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't really believe that is what is being described here for one main reason. They come from a place called the abyss. These have to be demons. And once we understand what the Bible has to say about the abyss, there is only one conclusion to draw. These creatures are demons. Now, I confess to you that I don't really fully understand these creatures, and neither do you, but I believe that these are the most hideous demonic creatures imaginable. Now, as we, as we saw in our study of Luke, demons are very real, even though there are many here in America who believe that we are too sophisticated to believe in demons. Now, that's one side. On the other side, there are some who have gone the other way and are obsessed with demons and are trying to cast them out and bind them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we know they're real, and Jesus certainly believed that demons were real, and he and his apostles had true authority to cast them out. But what we need to understand here is that not all demons are presently loose on the earth. 
the Bible clearly teaches that there are some who have been locked away in a place called the abyss. That is a bottomless pit where certain demons have been kept under punishment. And what we see in this fifth trumpet is that some of these imprisoned demons are going to be turned loose for a time on the earth. Now let's back up and see what this passage of Scripture has to say in a little more detail. Notice, first of all, the star which had fallen. The star which had fallen. Look again at verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key to the bottomless pit was given to it? No. Him. Given to him. You know, earlier in our study of this book, in connection with the sixth seal, in chapter 6, verses 12 through 17, and with the fourth trumpet in chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, there is an unusual disturbance of the starry heavens. In chapter 6, the stars of heaven fall, even as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when it is shaken by a great wind. In chapter 8, a great star from heaven described as burning like a torch falls upon the rivers and the springs of water. Now, in these instances, it is probable that these references are being made to literal stars or fragments of them. And their falling to the earth is a form of divine judgment upon the wicked worlds. But the star mentioned in chapter 9, verse 1, seems to refer to a person rather than a literal star or meteor. It says the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. So this star is different from the others. Sometimes the word star refers to a heavenly body, as in chapter 8, verse 12. But the word is often used to refer to some kind of intelligent creature, usually an angel. We see that a couple times uh, in uh, Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, and you can find that in Job 38, verse 7. Both meanings are perfectly consistent with plain, normal interpretation In English, we use this word in the same two ways. Literally, a star means an astronomical entity. And equally literally, though as a figure of speech, we use the word sometimes to refer to a person like the star of a football team. And the phrase, had fallen, is in the Greek perfect tense, which means completed action in the past. In other words, when John was given this vision, this star had already fallen. This is not something that's going to happen uh, during the tribulation period. This is something that has already occurred. And we need to understand that the word star is often used in Scripture to refer to an angel which I believe is exactly what John is describing here, a fallen angel. Now, who is this star? Folks, in my mind, there's absolutely no question who this star is. It is none other than Lucifer, the star of the morning. This is Lucifer. Here's what the prophet Isaiah wrote about this star in Isaiah 14, 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. This is the fall of Satan. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus himself said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. In Revelation 9, 11, tells us that he is the king of these hideous demons that will be released from the bottomless pits. The fall of Satan 
described in chapter 9, verse 1, is not his original rebellion, though he and the angels who fell with him were banished from heaven, Satan has retained access to God where he constantly accuses the brethren, according to Scripture. But during the tribulation, he and his demon host will be unsuccessful in a battle against Michael and the holy angels. And as a result of their defeat, they will be permanently cast down to the earth. And I believe that's what this is referring to here. Turn with me for a moment to chapter 12 and look at verse 7. Chapter 12 and verse 7. Here is where that battle scene is described. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. <clears throat> and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. <coughs> he was thrown... <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. I believe that's what is being described in chapter 9. <clears throat> Back in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, the key to the bottomless pit was given to him. And remember that any authority that Satan has is always derived authority. Satan cannot do anything that God does not allow him to do. And since this is part of God's sovereign will for the punishment of the wicked during this period in history, he is given the keys to the bottomless pit for this specific time and purpose. This is an example of God's permissive will in regard to Satan. Just as we see in the book of Job, God allowed Satan to afflict Job to a certain degree. And that's what we see here. Now, what is this bottomless pit? Well, we don't have really enough time tonight to deal adequately with this. But very quickly, it is a place where rebellious Angels are kept until the final judgment. Abusos, the word Greek word for bottomless, appears seven times in Revelation, always in reference to the abode of incarcerated demons. And the bottomless pit or the abyss is also the place where Satan himself is going to be bound and chained during the 1,000-year millennium. Luke 8.31 gives us a good indication of what the abyss is. Jesus, you may remember, was about to cast a multitude of demons out of the Gadarene demoniac. And verse 31 tells us that the demons were entreating him not to command them to depart into the abyss. They did not want to go to that terrible place where all the worst and most hideous demons are kept in prison. And this tells us that the abyss is a place where the demons do not want to go. It is a place where demons are chained. It is not for the souls of men. It is only for certain demons who have become imprisoned by God. Now you say, which demons are bound there? Well, according to 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6, God chained demons in the bottomless pit as far back as Genesis chapter 6. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Jude 6 says, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds 
under darkness for the judgment of that great day. Now, I don't have time to go into this in a lot of detail tonight, but these were demons who cohabited with women in an attempt to produce a race of unredeemable demon men. And it is possible that God has put other demons in there throughout history as Luke 8.31 seems to suggest. But at least we know the demons from the incident in Genesis 6 are bound there. And because the Bible says that the demons that were bound in Genesis 6 for cohabiting with women are kept under eternal bonds, Jude 6, it is impossible, I mean, excuse me, it is possible that these will be the demons that will be released here, but it will also be possible there would be other demons released as well. I believe that these demons are the most wicked, hideous creatures we could ever imagine. And when you see all the previews to all the horror movies that men, we know that men can imagine some pretty hideous things. But these will be worse than anything men can imagine. And during a portion of the second half of the tribulation, the bottomless pit is going to be opened and demons who have been bound as far back as Genesis 6 will be turned, turned loose upon the earth. Now, think about the ramifications of this. The intensity of evil during the Great Tribulation will be so much greater than any other period in the history of the world. Partially because there will be more demons on the earth than ever before. But add to that the fact that the church will have been removed and the reign of a world dictator who is now possessed by Satan himself, and you have unrestrained evil in those days. Yes, there will be some believers, and there will be the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, but this is going to be a dark, dark day indeed. Listen, if you think things are bad in our day and time, we haven't seen anything yet. It is going to get much, much worse. Well, let's move on to the opening of the pit. Look with me at verse 2 again. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Can you just imagine that in your mind? He unlocks the prison house, of the fallen angels and the most awful satanic agencies come forth to begin their awful work, to torment men for five months. The light is now completely blotted out, and in the darkness coming from the pit of the abyss, the demon powers will begin to do their fearful work. The smoke Polluting the sky symbolizes the corruption of hell belched forth from the abyss to pollute the world. Listen, you do not want to be around when Satan pops the cork off this pit. Thousands of the most hideous creatures imaginable will begin to attack men. And for the first time in human history, all those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior will come under demonic affliction. This is real stuff. These demons are so vicious and evil that God has had them locked up throughout history, but now they're going to be turned loose. One author has entitled this, When All Hell Breaks Loose, and that will literally be what it is upon the earth. You know, I understand that each night, <clears throat> except during the winter months, out of the caves of Carlsbad Caverns National Park in New Mexico, several million bats emerge. And the sky is blackened for two hours 
as thousands follow thousands into the air at twilight for their nightly food gathering vigil. They look like, I've been told, the smoke of a great furnace. That's what's going to happen. This is just a small illustration of what this is going to be like in the fifth trumpet. Here they are likened to locusts because of the way locusts uh, come in plagues to swarm in and destroy everything in their path. Locust swarms can be incredibly large. In 1889, there was a swarm of locusts over the Red Sea that purportedly covered 2,000 square miles of locusts. The worst locust plague in modern times struck in the Middle East in 1951-52 when in Iran, Iraq, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, every green and growing thing was devoured across hundreds of thousands of square miles. Locusts eat grain, leaf, and stalk right down to the bare ground. When a swarm arises and flies on its way, the green field is left a desert. Barrenness and desolation stretches as far as the eye can see. That's why this analogy is being used here. But notice what the passage says about these creatures from the pit. Notice, first of all, the activity of these creatures. Verse 3 says, they will have the power of scorpions. Verse 5 says, they will not be allowed to kill anyone, but they will torment them. And the fact that three times in this passage, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 10, their power to inflict pain is compared to scorpions indicates these aren't actually locusts, right? Because locusts aren't scorpions, and locusts do not have stings in their tails. These creatures do. You know, the sting of a scorpion is one of the most painful experiences ever that anyone can ever have. And we've been told that <clears throat> the veins and the nerves from a scorpion sting make you feel like your nerves are on fire. Uh, wherever you are, you are stung, that it's on fire. And the sting is seldom fatal, but it can last for many, many days. And notice that the Bible tells us here that the pain of these scorpions will last five months. Imagine that. Imagine being tormented for five months. It's interesting that the average lifespan for a scorpion is about five months. And the torment that is inflicted upon men in this plague will be much worse than the actual sting of real scorpions. Now, we don't know exactly what this sting will be, but the Bible says it will cause men to want to die. They're going to want to die. So although this judgment will be temporary, this is going to be extremely severe. Note, secondly, the limitation of these creatures. Look at verse 4. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. In the same way that God puts limits on Satan in the account of Job, so he also limits what these creatures can do. They cannot touch or hurt any green thing. They are not there to eat the grass and the leaves of the trees. And by the way, as I said last week, <clears throat> The reference to grass here suggests that some time has passed since the first trumpet sounded, which has allowed the green grass to grow back. There has been a partial recovery of the environment at this point, so they are here forbidden to hurt the grass or any green thing. And they can't touch anyone who has God's seal. 
Of course, that would include not only the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who were sealed in chapter 7, but also all the tribulation saints. Revelation 22.4 seems to indicate that all believers will be sealed by God in their foreheads. So in essence, they can't torment anyone except those who have the mark of the beast. They will be the ones who will be tormented. And this, by the way, is similar to what happened in the Old Testament when God sent the plagues on Egypt. He separated the Israelites from the Egyptians and they were not hurt by any of the plagues. <clears throat> well, notice thirdly the effect of these creatures. Verse 6 tells us that the torment will be so bad that they will seek death but will not find it. <clears throat> In those days, men will seek death and will not find it, and they will long to die, and death flees from them. Now, this is somewhat of a mystery here. I'll just, I acknowledge that. This is very, very difficult to understand. How is it that men will want to commit suicide but not be able to? You know, many evangelical scholars have written that God will prevent them from taking their own lives. For example, John MacArthur writes, all attempts at suicide, whether by gunshot, poison, drowning, or leaping from buildings, will fail. That's interesting, isn't it? Ryrie says, the effect of this torment is to drive men to suicide, but they will not be able to die. Death will not be possible. Bodies will not sink and drown. Poisons and pills will have no effect. And somehow, even bullets and knives will not do their intended job. Now, folks, personally, I don't really understand that. But the text does say they will seek death and will not find it. And it does say they will long to die and death flees from them. That's what the scripture says. Now, I don't know any other way to take that. And I'm certainly not going to spiritualize this and say that it means something else. One author wrote, this is the best definition of hell I have ever seen. That people will long to die. People in hell will want to just be done with the suffering and they won't be able to. It will just continue. What a horrible picture this is of demonic torment. Men will be in total agony day and night. Then notice the appearance of these creatures. <clears throat> They're described for us in verses 7 through 10. And the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads, as it were, crowns like gold... And their faces were like the faces of men, and they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. Does that sound like anything you've ever seen? Not to me. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots of many horses rushing to battle, and they have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is their power to hurt men for five months. The physical appearance of these locusts is extremely gross. They're like horses prepared for battle, having crowns on their heads with faces like men, hair like women, and teeth like lions. In verse 9, the locusts are declared to have breastplates of iron, implying that they will be immune to destruction. The military won't be able to kill them. They are also equipped with wings, which will sound like chariots and horses rushing to battle, implying the speed in which they attack and prevent possible evasion. Now, some have said these are Cobra helicopters because of the description, but that doesn't explain why they come from the, ab the abyss. Now, it would be difficult to describe a more fearful spectacle than these 
instruments of divine judgment, utterly wicked in themselves and released from the abyss to bring about this terrifying scene. Even Steven Spielberg would have trouble dreaming up something as horrible as this. This is really beyond comprehension. But notice lastly, the response of men. Response of men. You say, these judgments are too horrible for a loving God. But we need to understand that these creatures are released upon men for the purpose of bringing them to repentance. Even though there is no indication they repent, in fact, Joe MacArthur writes, indeed, it appears that those who go through the fifth trumpet judgment without repenting may be confirmed in their unrepentant state. And this is really, though, the mercy of God. One last time to call them to repentance. Now, certainly it would be an act of mercy on the part of God to torment men for five months if that would result in bringing them to repentance so that they would avoid eternity in hell. That would be an act of mercy. In addition, unbelievers will also hear the message of salvation from the 144,000 uh, Jewish evangelists, so they're going to they're going to hear the gospel. So, in addition to this judgment, there's going to be the witness, the testimony of the gospel, and they're going to be the two witnesses of God to testify. They're even going to be uh, a, an, either an angel or an eagle flying through the mid heaven, proclaiming the eternal gospel. They're going to get one last opportunity. And the five months will be for many people the last opportunity to repent and believe before they die and are permanently hardened in their unbelief. Now, in contrast to God's mercy, we read in verse 11 who Satan is. He is Abaddon, that's the Hebrew word. Apollyon, that's the Greek word. They both mean destroyer. He is the destroyer. The thief comes to kill and steal and destroy. That's what Satan wants to do. God wants to save. Satan wants to destroy. And listen, if we really knew who Satan was, we wouldn't even make jokes about him. We would weep for men who are under his control. And sadly, even the horrifying experience of this demon infestation will not cause many, if any, to repent. In chapter 9, verse 20, we read these words, And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. That is the tragedy of this chapter. These horrendous judgments and still... Those who have yet to believe do not repent. Well, why do we need to know about this? Well, we need to know it because it's God's word. We need to know it. God gave it to us to know. And we should understand it. But I believe it's part of what gives us that urgency as believers. That we know these are terrible things that are coming. And we must warn those that we know who are lost in sin and we must give them the gospel while we have that opportunity. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight again for your word. We thank you for the way you have given us your truth. And Lord, we we know all of it is for our benefit. That which is uh, uh, 
painted in such a graphic, horrific way, as well as those passages that dwell on the positive and the joy of the Christian life. And all of this is for our benefit. So Lord, use it in our lives. Make us more urgent. Help us to know that these are things that are part of your judgment to come and that we might warn those around us while we can. Help us to do that in Jesus' name, amen.